So good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, dear uh, uh, members of the faculty of the RGSL. Good morning, dear students. Um, I take it uh, I have the pleasure of uh, greeting the students of the uh, BA programs. Uh, and good morning, my own students uh, somewhere uh, of the master programs uh, at the RGSL, as well as everybody else. Uh, in uh, uh, Latvia or beyond, uh, who is uh, watching us on various uh, means of um, communication. Now, this is the last uh, uh, class uh, in uh, uh, what we call uh, a foundation course for the master students. And of course, uh, it will be a, a bit of a challenge um, for maybe some of you. Um, but at the same time, uh, challenge always is a very good thing because it makes one person, all of the people, grow. And it also will give you a little bit of an insight uh, how we debate uh, issues uh, with the master students uh, at, the, at the law school. Now, uh, the final class is on, um, in the domain of European Union law. But uh, uh, given uh, my own life experience, uh, this is uh, uh, the Court of Justice is the third court uh, on which I serve. Uh, I thought I could share with you, um, in a way, through my experience. So it's uh, it's an insider's uh, uh, perspective on uh, on courts in Europe, um, having served on the European Court of Human Rights and, and having served on the Constitutional Court of Latvia and now the, the Court of Justice. So you will have the possibility to have a perspective um, because, because um, evidently I appreciate and love all of these courts, even if sometimes they uh, may not have easy relations. Nevertheless, um, uh, I would like to present to you a vision of uh, uh, Europe of values and synergies. Um, and both uh, uh, notions, values and synergies, are very important uh, for European continent. And uh, uh, that uh, these, these notions, as they are elaborated by courts in Europe, because clearly, because courts uh, play uh, a very important role, in fact, in both in making these synergies uh, and in uh, uh, protecting and concretizing the values. Uh, now, that's what uh, we will discuss um, uh, today. Now, it is very important uh, to keep in mind that Europe among other continents of the world, uh, has a particularly elaborate and dense picture of courts of all levels and various competences. We, we really have a lot of courts. <laughs> now, um, what I would like to explain to you today is what's the reason for that? How come we have so many courts in Europe? Where does it come from? You know, because it's always, trust me, it is always extremely important to know who had the first idea, why that idea emerged at the time it emerged. I know you are young, but and maybe the history is not necessarily your passion, but in order to understand who you are today, you really have to know the past and uh, to foresee where we are going next. So I will explain why do we have so many courts uh, uh, in Europe. And I will, uh, in my second part, uh, I will uh, explain to you, um, I will provide some thoughts, indeed based on my own experience of uh, many years by now being a judge. Um, so where do we go next? What is the future? of what I call European architecture of uh, judiciary and uh, what are the possibilities and also the dangers in the future um, as concerns the promotion and protection of our common values. Now, 
uh, as I said, uh, for the purposes of this task of today's lecture, I have to indeed recall uh, the history and uh, my master's students my previous ones and current ones uh, know already that uh, they are not surprised that I usually start um, with uh, the history. Now, uh, there is one caveat uh, before I move into history that I would like to share with you. Um, it is um, interesting that basically, well, today, um, is, um, uh, we, we could mark a one-year anniversary of uh, a very important gathering that took place also in Riga a year ago. And it was first in the history of European Union where, and the idea came uh, from the Latvian Constitutional Court at the time, and the Court of Justice uh, uh, was very enthusiastic, and so the two courts together organized it. So a year ago in Riga, we had uh, the first uh, uh, sort of meeting and exchange, you know, direct exchange of all of the constitutional courts of the European Union and the Court of Justice on uh, a very important question, what happens when uh, it seems the national identity of a member state of the European Union happens probably to contradict the primacy of European Union law. And so all of the constitutional courts, which are the ultimate uh, um, judicial bodies at a national level to say what national identity is, were gathered in, uh, in Riga and, and, and had uh, this debate. So year on, we are continuing <laughs> discussing European courts and how they uh, interact. Now, as far as the origins of the European judiciary are concerned, first let me clarify for you three concepts that I would like to use uh, for the purposes uh, of this class and actually in, in, in my academic work I'm trying to sort of conceptualize these three concepts to, and, and, and to, to offer that in a European academic uh, debate. So, the notion of European judiciary uh, denotes, in my mind, all courts in Europe forming a web of judicial interrelations within common European legal space. The notion of European courts refers to, well, basically the two main European courts, international, supranational, European Court of Human Rights, uh, European Court of Justice, but also we have uh, a few more. So European courts, it's international and supranational courts in Europe. While I will also use the third notion, and that is courts in Europe. And with that notion, uh, I will address the many and different courts at all levels uh, in Europe, which may have uh, a narrow or a specialized uh, competence, but which all comply with the standard, a European standard, of independent and impartial tribunal. So these three notions uh, uh, as we go. Now, it can be argued that at the roots of a European judiciary lies the ideas of separation of powers, the checks and balances, which in fact saw its early origins in the ancient Rome, and more specifically in Jerusalem, where the idea uh, of a court independent from the legislator and the executive was first articulated. Also, the fact that the Middle Ages and the early modern period experienced growing resort to arbiters in Europe and the establishment uh, of courts to adjudicate uh, disputes between subjects of laws at that time they were not states in our sense, yeah? Remember, think about, uh, place yourself in Middle Ages a little bit. But the arbiters were resorted to. Uh, so we, from that, we can already deduce this emergence of the tradition in adjudication in Europe. Now, during the 18th century, uh, uh, Abbe de Saint-Pierre expressed an idea which for that time was extremely progressive. And so in 1713, he suggested that the creation of the European Union 
and, uh, 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 and placed uh, uh, within uh, the European Union the obligatory adjudication of disputes between the members of such a union by, and he said, by a supreme organ of uh, uh, the possible union. So it is uh, Abbé Saint-Pierre who, uh, for the first time, articulates a kind of a dispute settlement body for European uh, Union at the time. The, the way, of course, uh, you know, he uh, understood um, Union uh, at that time, before we still have strong states. Now, it is important to note uh, um, that he suggested the Union, with an independent dispute resolution body, with the aim to achieve perpetual peace in Europe. Jean-Jacques Rousseau also uh, attempted to articulate slightly later the remedy against, as, as he called it, all human ills by proposing, among others, a European uh, federation of states. And indeed, in such European federation of states, uh, the differences would be submitted to arbitration. Now, as you know, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau himself, nevertheless, nevertheless did not uh, believe in the possibility to construct uh, a European legal order, a kind of a common European legal space, and to overcome what at that time had already become a, uh, 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 a very, very central idea in Europe, that of absolute sovereignty. Now, um, the consolidation of a modern state, uh, which is, uh, those of you who study international law, uh, know by now, sort of the consolidation, in a way, the moment when the consolidation of a modern state uh, uh, is, is, is pinpointed in history is the Peace of Westphalia, and uh, which followed the, uh, uh, the end of the Thirty Years' War uh, in uh, Europe. And since, since then, well into the 19th century, we see uh, the consolidation of the idea of absolute sovereignty and we see the consolidation of the idea of a state. And basically from 19th century on, this is what everybody, every nation strives for, to have a state such as, such as Latvia, such as France, etc., etc. Now, um, but uh, in fact, uh, the uh, conceptualization of the idea of absolute sovereignty uh, of power, of public power, is attributed, as you know, to uh, Jean Baudin. Now, um, we have uh, this idea of uh, absolute sovereignty going inwards and outwards. Um, well, inwards, of course, with the absolute power of monarch, uh, etc. But we are interested to discuss um, the external uh, implications of the idea of absolute sovereignty because that has a direct impact on this whole history of formation of uh, international courts uh, in, in Europe. And of course, um, you would think that the idea of absolute sovereignty conflicts with any possibility for interstate adjudication, isn't it? It is so. And so what we have in the 19th century, we have this idea, you know, when you have a power, you are absolutely in charge on the one hand. And then we have, I mean, following the Napoleonian Wars and all of the other wars um, sort of during the 19th century, we have, you also see that the states, European states are sort of ready to give up their differences and to start cooperate. Because I do see that war actually in the end of the day, following many centuries, that war delivers uh, um, um, only only destruction and, and difficulties. And so you have these two, two ideas competing, you know, the need for cooperation to avoid divorce, indeed. And with that would come a peaceful dispute uh, resolution, you know, necessity, and of course, this idea of absolute sovereignty. And that should not be underestimated. The history of this confrontation where we come from cannot be underestimated. And I am saying it still exists in the way we operate today. Hmm? Now, so nevertheless, we uh, in fact uh, 
did uh, achieve the moment where, I mean, the idea is starting with Abbé de Saint-Pierre, but also Rousseau, and certainly Immanuel Kant, where the ideas um, of, of uh, having uh, a supranational organization, an international organization where the states cooperate with the purpose of achieving a perpetual peace. I mean, we have actually arrived, you know, that starting the 20th century and, uh, and even, even now, uh, uh, despite the difficulties that the United Nations has in, in managing uh, somehow uh, the, the war waged by Russia in Ukraine, no one is, no one is suggesting we shouldn't have a, a universal organization organization and so that is part of the thinking of our uh, humanity so uh, throughout the history uh, the idea uh, that wars and other serious disputes between subjects of law should be entrusted to independent third party uh, resolution is present and it does evolve along with the evolution of the forms of organization of our societies. The more advanced we become as communities, the more we see the need for proper independent adjudication of uh, the disputes. Um, it is, and that's my kind of interim uh, sort of conclusion on the very uh, quick uh, rush through the history, it is um, uh, fair to say that the idea of dispute resolution by an independent authoritative party accompanies the evolution of ideas of governance in Europe. And it is a very, in fact, it is, uh, uh, I mean, in a way, uh, also a European idea par excellence. Now, um, however, submitting modern states sort of by the end of the 19th century, and, and I could refer to uh, Alabama uh, claims between the uh, arbitration between the United States and the United Kingdom. That would be a, a, a sort of important point in history. So, but submitting modern states to international permanent court is to be seen, I must say, as an ultimate achievement in the evolution of these ideas and especially in so far as such management of disputes is considered really important for the maintenance of peace uh, among uh, the states. What is also a, a very uh, uh, European, and it is an achievement uh, certainly in Europe, is the idea that political and executive power must be submitted to independent judicial scrutiny and that idea, too, took a very long time to evolve. I mean, we are, we are talking about centuries of having arrived where we are now today in democratic states. We do take things for granted, but it has been a major and a very difficult human fight to have what certainly we share today. Now, um, the formation and consolidation of a closely related web of, Europe of a European judiciary has in particular taken place uh, since the end of the World War II, no surprise. Um, and it all together uh, represents, as we stand today, uh, the evolution of European societies and in especially the evolution of our societies in terms of what values are important yeah and what kind of relations we would like to have with power in our societies now it is to be pointed out that uh, even though world war ii uh, gave rise to the understanding that another lapse into fascism and totalitarianism well, as well as resistance uh, to communism, which was a reason for post-war uh, uh, institutions in Europe, uh, which uh, you may uh, recall from your history studies at that time, uh, Eastern Europe was already submitted to communism. So what we see in Western Europe with the foundation of the Council of Europe in 1949, with the foundation of European Coal and Steel Community in 1951, we actually see um, the reaction of the democratic world 
to try to shield themselves from communism and totalitarianism. But this, if you would go to the sources and look at the drafting process of uh, relevant instruments at that time, you would see that uh, even, you know, place yourself, we are sort of, you know, uh, 46, 47, 48, uh, 49, um, that moment did not automatically mean the creation of strong European courts. The European courts have gained their power only along the time with the evolution. Now, there was a desire uh, to ensure peace, certainly, and to avoid totalitarianism. And, but Western European governments, uh, judging from Travaux Preparatoire, had complex negotiations in drafting European Convention on Human Rights and actually on agreeing on what kind of control mechanism would be feasible at the European level to oversee their compliance with the Convention. And so you can, at th this moment too, you can argue that, you know, this, this idea of absolute sovereignty of a power, it still impacts these negotiations. Now, uh, it was, however, at that time, uh, it was uh, turned into a question, uh, not of sort of uh, sovereignty, you know, of Westminster or, or uh, sort of uh, uh, Bundestag, it was not that it was turned into a question of legitimacy of European judges. Because in democracies, it is extremely important that through elections, it is a people that elect their parliament and that there is in, a, in such a way elected body that appoints the judges. That's a legitimacy link with a people for the judges. Now, when European courts were sort of con conceived, the problem was, uh, how do we elect the European judges? What will be their legitimacy? Now, I can tell you that this question has, in fact, accompanied us in Europe. I mean, up to, up to now. I've gone through uh, that uh, several times. Now, over the years, uh, the procedure of selecting and appointing European judges has improved, has changed. There have been attempts to make it more transparent, more democratic, sort of there are independent assessments at the European level. Nowadays, compared to what it used to be uh, uh, when I was elected, for example, in 2004 to the European Court of Human Rights, the procedure has changed rather radically and in my mind to the better but of course, that question of legitimacy, because we don't have single European people. We don't have a single state. So, you know, how do you get to ensure a legitimacy of European judges? That is still, an, and there is a lot of writing uh, also on, on this issue. However, uh, in, uh, uh, there has been, uh, there has been uh, indeed an improvement uh, as far as um, I can see. Now, what I would like to sort of, again, um, before I go into uh, already details where we are, I would like to finish my first part by, by saying that I think for every one of us um, studying law and social sciences and, and seeing the future uh, in, in these various professions and maybe seeing also somebody would like to become a judge, um, I think it is important to realize that um, the view we take uh, on the role of courts um, in Europe, um, it reflects an important part of uh, our philosophical, political thinking, how we have as Europeans evolved, but also, and that I would like really to quote, it reflects our legal imagination. And that's a phrase I borrow from uh, uh, a colleague at Helsinki University, Professor Marti Koskaniemi. It is about our minds imagining and then implementing our ideas. Now, uh, a European uh, judiciary, what it consists of? Um, there are two main systems of law at a European level with 
their respective courts, which, as you know by now, uh, have their respective uh, Bill uh, of Rights. Um, it is also so that the European legal space includes uh, other subsystems and special tribunals. And uh, uh, I would also add to a European, this very, very busy house of European judiciary, I would add all the constitutional courts or courts with constitutional uh, jurisdiction who also interpret and apply human rights, but all the courts that apply European Union law. Imagine, <laughs> it is busy, it's a traffic, no end <laughs> in all directions. So um, uh, I also should add, and maybe I have time to mention that, we have uh, in Europe two subsystems of what I call internationalized courts, and I will get to that. So as you know, the European Court of Human Rights, which is based in Strasbourg, just in case, in France, has now uh, 46 uh, jurisdiction over 46 European states, and still, uh, even if the Russian Federation was uh, excluded from the organization, uh, Russia was the 47th, it is still pretty much almost uh, 800 million people, uh, potential applicants to the European Court of Human Rights, that uh, this court with its jurisdiction covers when it implements European Convention on Human Rights. Now, the judiciary of the European Union, uh, as, as you know, uh, consists of two courts, my court, the Court of Justice, and the General Court and both are uh, based in uh, uh, Luxembourg. Now, uh, the, ju uh, the, the judiciary of the European Union, actually, so far, is the only uh, truly supranational judiciary in the world. You may know that in Africa, there is also an African Union, and they also are, are striving to have uh, uh, a court of justice uh, as a judicial body and also the, the Court of Human Rights. So they are looking very much, very closely how Europe sort of manages with it, its institutions. But uh, in terms of uh, the level of integration that the uh, 27 member states of the European Union have achieved, uh, there is so far in the world no comparison. Um, it is uh, absolutely uh, amazing. Um, at the same time, I can also tell you it's extremely, extremely challenging. Now, as part of the peace settlement in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and there I come to something that we don't talk maybe t uh, often enough, um, in 1995, uh, the Constitutional Court was set up, and that Constitutional Court includes among nine judges of the court, three judges who are nominated by the president of the European Court of Human Rights. And that's what I call, this is an international element into a domestic constitutional court. Sort of this is an internationalized, in that sense, uh, uh, court or, or, a, or a hybrid. Similarly, following the end of war, uh, also in, uh, in uh, um, well, in Kosovo, or concerning Kosovo, in 1999, Kosovo Constitutional Court, and also other courts in Kosovo, were formed uh, um, as a kind of internationalized national courts uh, during the period of post-war settlements and the transition towards the formation uh, of a state. Now, these two cases reflect the constitutional role, in fact, given to the European uh, Convention on Human Rights, the impact and the presence of the European Court of Human Rights uh, in forming uh, uh, the, these uh, courts in, in these two uh, states. And in fact, uh, what you see is the role that the European Convention on Human Rights with the court has played in Europe for the purposes of post-war settlements. I mean, that is an interesting example um, in, in Europe. And what you also see that within uh, today's European legal space, in a way, uh, strict boundaries between an international treaty 
and its control mechanism and national legal systems is in fact fading away. You don't have these strict boundaries. Huh? It's become, it is becoming more diluted when we deal with you know, courts adjudicating law with sort of European uh, uh, element. Now, one of the main tasks of the European courts that I have mentioned to you uh, so far is un undoubtedly adjudicating on human rights. You cannot imagine today's Europe without this principal task. The reason being, not least, the last two wars uh, and, unfortunately, new war in Europe that confirms uh, uh, that uh, importance to human rights. Um, yeah, uh, at the beginning, uh, it indeed was uh, the main purpose of uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, where uh, in its um, preamble, uh, it stated very clearly, the pursuit of peace based upon justice and international cooperation is vital for the preservation of human society and civilization and uh, fundamental freedoms are the foundation of justice and peace in the world. That was a program. Now, you can ask yourselves, have we achieved it? I think we are still on the way of it. Now, to remind you, um, you know, when the coal and steel community in 51 and the treaties of Rome in, in 57 establishing European economic community were, were conceived, they, of course, originally focused on economic matters, on building, you know, common economic sort of spaces. You would think economy has nothing to do with that wrong, because the purpose why uh, the six original founders of what we now know, European Union, started pulling the governance together over managing strategic resources, such as coal and steel, the purpose was to avoid, yet again, the war uh, emerging in that uh, part of Europe. So also, the, uh, at the very basis of the European Union is that same purpose, perpetual peace. Now, um, since the 86 Single European Act, the uh, uh, European project, which we now call European Union, also has seen dramatic uh, evolution, dra dramatic changes, because it had since the idea of common internal market, focusing on markets, has moved into the idea of union of citizens. And if you would look at the uh, paradigm of the Court of Justice, not even mentioning the uh, EU legislative process, you see the paradigm actually has sh shifted and we have placed in the centre a citizen of the European Union so that it is a citizen who benefits from the fundamental freedoms, freedom of movement, freedom of establishment, freedom of movement of capital, of services. It has to be a citizen who benefits from that. There is a, a, a considerable shift actually in the, in the paradigm. Now, the EU courts are not the only supranational courts in Europe, by the way. The EFTA court, I would like to, to mention, and the Benelux Court of Justice also are, in fact, supranational courts for the purposes of the states uh, forming part of e EFTA and the Benelux uh, uh, countries. Now, uh, as I told you uh, already at the start, uh, to in this crowded house, we should count in constitutional courts, we should count in sup uh, sup supreme courts, and on the occasions also all of the other courts in Europe when uh, they apply fundamental rights or European Union law. So, as it has been uh, uh, confirmed uh, in practice and in European uh, uh, academic writings, all these courts no longer operate in isolation, but carry a common legal responsibility for the European legal space. And it is indeed so. And I th in fact, um, you know, from a practical point of view, I can share with you, of course, 
at the beginning it was uh, the two sort of main uh, uh, jurisdictions at the European level, the uh, court in Strasbourg and the courts in Luxembourg, who really felt this responsibility for common European legal space. And what I see now over the years, and having also been back in a national jurisdiction, of course, it takes time and work, and uh, there has to be conscious uh, activity at the national level. But I see how national courts also more and more within this spirit of European <laughs> Union realize that it is their responsibility for common European legal space. Yeah, I mean, we are all in it together. So, uh, to, uh, to sum it up, uh, uh, at this stage, so today we live within a common European legal space where a European judiciary ensures equal protection of individual rights and watches over any risks of abuse of political power. And I would like to emphasize that. Now, the European judiciary shares responsibility for common values in Europe. And as I mentioned, I unfortunately believe that we take it rather for granted that we have all these rights, that we have all these principles and that they are enforced by independent courts. Now, if you look around the world, and please do so, you will realize very quickly how privileged we are in Europe, in fact. And uh, uh, yes, for these privileges, I would like to emphasize that it is Ukraine today who is fighting for our privileges. Now, as far as practice is concerned, um, the practice, of course, <laughs> there is a lot of it, and it's extremely technical, and it's extremely detailed. Um, I will try to transmit to, to, to some of you uh, uh, what this common responsibility for European legal space, uh, what sort of uh, fights we have had uh, in it. Um, I will start with opinion uh, 213. Yeah, um, uh, for, and I get there. Uh, in opinion 213 of the Court of Justice, uh, which was handed down on 18 December 2014, and I should make a point, a preliminary point, that the Court of Justice has a competence uh, in accordance with Article 218 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union to actually assess the compatibility of draft international agreements that the European Union is going to conclude. Yeah? Now, uh, I, the point I would like to make it, it's a constitutional competence. For example, many constitutional courts, Latvian constitutional court including, have that competence before government signs the international treaty in order to avoid ab embarrassment later you can go to the Constitutional Court and ask, is this compatible with our Constitution, just in case? And so, uh, also the Court of Justice has that competence, and in the, uh, this opinion, what the Court of Justice assessed, it was the compatibility of the accession protocol of the European Union to the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, in the opinion, un uh, unfortunately, the, uh, uh, in my mind, indeed, unfortunately, the Court of Justice uh, uh, said that the accession uh, protocol, as it was drafted, as it stood at that time, was incompatible with the founding treaties of the European Union. Why? I will, uh, uh, I will tell you uh, in, a, in a minute. But on this competence uh, of the Court of Justice, you already see a particular feature of the su supranational uh, court. You have the constitutional elements. It is, in fact, European Union has a constitutional, you know, flavor around it and about it. And that tells you of the level of integration that is achieved in the European Union. Now, uh, as far as uh, uh, opinion is concerned, it reminded that the principle of sincere cooperation which is set out in first paragraph of Article 4.3 of Treaty on European Union to ensure uh, that in their respective territories the application of and respect of uh, EU law 
it takes place, um, that was uh, basically the main uh, message from the opinion that uh, European Union law, its primacy, has to be ensured within the member states. And uh, it interpreted further Article 4, and the court said that member states have to take any appropriate measures, general or particular, to ensure ful fulfillment of obligations arising from the, uh, from the treaties. Now, the court further said that the European Union legal order has been consolidated so much that it is a special legal order and the principle that characterizes it is autonomy of this legal order. And it is for the Court of Justice to ensure within uh, this special legal order it's uh, uh, the consistency and uniformity of interpretation of EU law. Now, the national courts, uh, said the Court of Justice, in fact, uh, well, are together with the Court of Justice responsible for consistency and uniformity. And it is this system that ensures protection of individual uh, rights. Um, you have uh, two things um, here, and that's what the difficulty we have been dealing with in Europe. European legal order, EU legal order, is a, is a very detailed, very powerful, autonomous um, legal order which has a primacy at a national level. And it does protect individual rights more and more uh, with uh, now the Fundamental Rights Charter being legally uh, uh, binding. Um, Article uh, 4, as you see, is a complicated article because it also allows for national identities to be part of the European thinking. And this is why I started where I started with the Riga conference. And it is so that there is a friction between what national courts consider as national identity and the primacy of, of EU law. And this is why in opinion uh, 213, the Court of Justice emphasized the responsibility of national <laughs> courts also for EU law part in all of our story. So, um, and it becomes even more complicated because the accession protocol was to, to the European Convention on Human Rights, which is also implemented by the national courts. So, as you can see, with among all these laws that one has to implement here, for example, in Riga, talk to a judge, you, will, you, you may well imagine that uh, it is very, very complicated to be a judge in Europe. <laughs> um, the, the opinion 213 pointed out that there are risks uh, if this variety of legal relations were to affect the primacy and autonomy of the EU law. And that is the concern of the Court of just, uh, uh, Justice. The Court of Justice said that it has not said European Union cannot be bound by an international treaty such as European Convention on Human Rights. It has not said that it will not accept, you know, the binding judgments of another international court. But what it has said is that what should not happen is that the external court to the European Union legal order should somehow jeopardize the competence of EU legislator and the Court of Justice to actually interpret and develop EU law. You see the fine sort of lines uh, that have been uh, drawn, not, not easy always uh, to follow. And there were many difficulties uh, that the court pointed out. Uh, basically, I will sum it up uh, in a nutshell. It was afraid on two accounts when it comes to protection of human rights. It was saying first that it probably is not right that uh, the um, decisions of the European Court of Human Rights 
will be binding on the Court of Justice, uh, even when European Court of Human Rights would be assessing EU law against the Convention, if EU accedes yeah, to the system. At the same time, the decisions, it said so, of the Court of Justice will not bind European Court of Human Rights <laughs> in Strasbourg. Um, that was one criticism, that one line. The other one concerned the level of protection of fundamental rights, where it said, because European Union law is coherent, because of mutual respect and sincere cooperation, it cannot be so that within the EU member states, constitutionally, fundamental rights are more protected for example, in one state and not in the other state. So there is a, a variable that is emerging that EU law cannot accept within the competence of EU law, you see. And so <coughs> it is this possible variable that the court considered to be a, a, a risk to the consistency and coherence of the EU law. Now, uh, as I uh, uh, already mentioned to you, um, I am personally, uh, I was not <laughs> at that time, uh, I'm still not uh, convinced uh, by all of, uh, all of this um, uh, reasoning. And it is therefore that I should present to you um, a um, next uh, set uh, of, uh, of cases where I think the Court of Justice clarifies its position within this web of European uh, judiciary. And these are the Tariko cases. Uh, it is uh, Tariko uh, September 2015 case, Tariko 1 known generally, and Tariko 2 uh, December 2017. Um, the Tariko cases uh, concerned Italian um, criminal uh, code uh, in particular, the uh, um, limitation uh, uh, procedure, limitation rules. Basically, uh, if you know the criminal proceedings drag on, then uh, you can have under criminal law that statute of limitations, sort of the limitation period, uh, sort of starts uh, enters the picture, and you can no longer prosecute uh, uh, a person who has been uh, investigated. Now, uh, the Court of Justice had serious concerns because what happens is, given uh, how much funds from the European Union go to the member states, and in the field of um, you know, different types of financing of different, uh, uh, different uh, projects in the member states, European Union wants to ensure that EU funds are correctly spent, that there is no corruption, that there is no abuse of the use of basically all our citizen money who are uh, paying on their uh, salaries. And that is provided in Articles 325 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Now, the court initially saw that the fact that according to Italian criminal law tradition, and that is part of their constitution, the principle of legal certainty, which is an element of rule of law, says you can't continue prosecute endlessly. I mean, we're 10 years or 15 years in a prosecution and nothing happens. How long the person, uh, the accused, will remain in such a state of uncertainty? That's certainly against the idea of fundamental rights. And so it is understandable why Italian constitutional tradition has that protection. Of course, from a EU law perspective, when it comes to protecting EU money, that perspective is not uh, you know, very interesting. And so the European Court in Tariko once said, no, that is against, uh, against, that is incompatible with the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Now, uh, Italian Constitutional Court came back second time to uh, the Court of Justice saying, because they had another set of uh, criminal uh, procedures, and they said, are we really meant not to apply our criminal code on limitations, uh, uh, provisions on limitations, 
because it is incompatible you know, with Article 325, when we know that the whole purpose of our limitation rules, it's not procedural, it is material. In Italian criminal law doctrine, this principle has a material content, meaning that it is you know, protection of fundamental rights and protection of the rule of law. And that has been sort of, it's a, it's a long tradition. The Court of Justice in Tariko II realized, came around and said, uh, in fact, yes, uh, we were not fully informed uh, in the first case. It was not fully explained uh, by then referring court. And uh, uh, this time it was the Constitutional Court uh, which did explain the constitutional nature of that uh, approach of the, of the limitation uh, provisions. And uh, the Court of Justice said legal certainty is part of our common values. In fact, Article 2 of the Treaty of on European Union, common values, it is part of rule of law, which is the core, in fact, of the European Union. And of course, uh, Article 325 cannot be interpreted in such a way that would go against you know, a number of these fundamental rights, rule of law sort of understandings. And so in Tariko II, what you see, unlike in Opinion 213, in fact, I should say, in Tariko II, you see the Court of Justice, in fact, engaging in a dialogue that was an example of dialogue between Italian Constitutional Court and the Court of Justice, where the two together were actually figuring out the content of a common rule of law. And definitely in Europe, we do not want to give away you know, legal certainty for an individual. That's sort of the, the, the minimum you could, uh, uh, you could imagine. Um, so I would say uh, that uh, Tariko uh, uh, II um, indeed is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, goes uh, into also um, uh, clarifying opinion 213. And I do hope that the European Union member states now hopefully are working on improving the accession protocol of the EU to the European Convention on Human Rights, because that would also bring a certain order in this architecture of European judiciary, because we need to clarify that relationship between so, at this moment still, two rather autonomous, but at the same time most important systems for Europeans. Now, I will also, Men uh, mention to you uh, another, uh, a very recent uh, development, uh, and that uh, has to do with a judgment uh, that uh, the Court of Justice uh, issued last week, actually, uh, on 7 September, and that was the dialogue between the Latvian Constitutional Court and the Court of Justice and uh, I happen to be in the composition of the Latvian Constitutional Court when, uh, in accordance with Article 267 of the Treaty on the Functioning on the, of the European Union, we decided to refer a question for interpretation to the Court of Justice, uh, just so that everybody knows. Two, uh, uh, 267 is the main dialogue tool between the national courts and the Court of Justice. Uh, when national courts apply European Union law, they can always sort of uh, really uh, uh, know that uh, in case they need uh, help, Court of Justice uh, will be there to, to help the national courts. And of course, there are uh, obligations when uh, national courts have to refer their, their questions uh, for interpretation to the Court of Justice. Now, um, in uh, uh, sort of the, uh, the case uh, Boris uh, Tsilevich um, and others of 7 September 2022, the question really was uh, about Article 4. 
because the Latvian Constitutional Court had to assess whether the law on uh, higher uh, education in Latvia, which was, um, to, uh, which was going to strengthen the uh, teaching in Latvian, in the state language, uh, also in private uh, universities for reasons of national identity, whether that actually is compatible with uh, European Union legal order, uh, because when you think about freedom of establishment, for example, I mean, there are universities, foreign universities, who would like to open the branches. We are today in one of such universities, which is teaching uh, in English. So the question really was, for obvious reasons, Latvia had uh, its reasons, and I believe they are legitimate, but also there is uh, an important sort of, you know, uh, moving around in the European Union that has to be uh, guaranteed. And how do you do that? And so uh, Latvian Constitutional Court, uh, after public hearing where this issue came up, um, we distinguished this aspect into a separate case and we asked questions to the Court of Justice. And so the court uh, on 7 uh, September issued its, um, its ruling. And again, uh, following the, the, the methodology, I would say, of Tariko 2, but in Tariko 2, uh, Article 4, uh, 2 was not maybe so crucially present. Because if you think about uh, national, uh, national identity in Latvia, then of course, I, I think the very core of it is the Latvian language. That's what it circulates about, uh, around and about. So that's, a, um, uh, that's what, uh, there are not too many other things, but uh, uh, national language indeed is such. And so the Court of Justice had a case of the very core of national identity, possibly confronting freedom of uh, establishment. And then uh, the Court of Justice uh, said uh, it uh, recognized that it is a fundamental matter of national identity, as uh, the, the constitution of the country and the constitutional court have explained. So they did recognize the position, how it is seen in Latvia. It did say in other countries it will be something else, but here it is. And so with this, you see that the motto of European Union, uh, united in diversity, that's the motto of European Union. So here we have a case where the diversity was conceptualized. Hmm? I, I admit it is a hard case in a sense that there you do have really, and I'm not talking about the cases where national identity can be abused. Also, I mean, everything is uh, happening and possi possible uh, in, the, in, in life. At the same time, the court said uh, uh, freedom of establishment is core of the European Union. And so how do these two core matters, you know, live together? Yeah. And so here in this judgment, you see that actually they do live together. The court said this, in this sense, national identity can restrict freedom of establishment, but it should restrict in a way that is compatible with uh, the principles uh, of, you know, uh, legitimate aim, necessity, and proportionality. Yeah, and so the court went through uh, a legitimate aim of national identity. Then uh, it went through the necessity. The court also uh, accepted that it is necessary. View what was submitted in the case. And in terms of uh, proportionality, what the court assessed, whether this restriction could have been different, could have taken a different shape. Yeah. And that, of course, that will always be uh, uh, the issue between national identity and fundamental freedoms of the European Union, will actually always fall on proportionality. What it invites, actually, is everybody, a national legislator and European legislator, to, in fact, nowadays think with more nuances. We have to develop our creativity, our imagination to ensure, you know, different how in a less possible way restrict the freedoms, not jeopardizing sort of the core values, either at a national level 
or uh, um, European level. And so, um, as you can see, I, I showed you also sort of the examples of, of this interaction, uh, and I try to do it in a simple way, of course, because when you read the judgments, that will be uh, a bit more uh, complicated. But uh, there are um, other sort of uh, uh, cases that I would wanted to mention to you to show these different relations sort of between the national courts, constitutional courts including, and the Court of Justice, between the Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights, opinion 213, yeah, it is there, but it is not the end of the story. Because what you see, for example, in uh, case uh, WJ uh, on the judiciary in Poland, uh, you see the, the synergy between uh, the judgments passed by the European Court of Human Rights in our uh, Astrazon against Iceland uh, case where the Court of Human Rights identified the core of what is reinstated and fine-tuned the court of, uh, core of what is an independent tribunal in Europe. And we, in the Court of Justice, we took that definition consisting of several elements and we put it as part, as the, uh, as part of European Union law. You see? And then, of course, the, the, uh, the famous 5 May 2020 Consti German Constitutional Court uh, judgment which is yet another uh, complicated, admittedly, dialogue between the German Constitutional Court and the Court of Justice. And the German Constitutional Court has had also, you know, difficult talks with uh, European Court of Human Rights. So, as I told you from the start, oftentimes, maybe, and even when you study, for example, law, you don't really picture how busy the judicial house <laughs> of Europe is. I do hope that I transmitted to you all of the ups and downs and solutions found. But um, what is probably the, the real sort of crux of the matter for you as the future of Europe, you will be the ones making decisions either you know as, as civil society as legislators or as judges or pleading brilliant cases speaking of strategic litigation uh, in front of the courts so what you have to be aware that it is a very 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 busy it is truly busy and every court is very conscious of its responsibility of course for the law it is responsible in for example in latvia Constitutional court, it's the constitution it has to ensure. But then, what is changing now in Europe, it is also this responsibility more and more coming uh, among the judges, European and national. We are actually responsible, you know, not to destroy, not to jeopardize, whether that is European Convention on Human Rights, whether this is national identities, we have to find the well-functioning synergies of everybody within a European judiciary to ensure, of course, all of the values and the thinking that we have achieved um, uh, in Europe. And so, um, yeah, um, in a very uh, uh, conclusion, uh, I should probably have my uh, two last uh, sentences in my long lecture, which I should probably <laughs> publish in the end of the day. Um, the, uh, I should say the following. Um, the construction of Europe uh, that we know today is really unprecedented. Uh, I am very glad we have come this far. We immediately see we have also serious problems, but we have really truly come uh, uh, very far to have a democratic, a democratic common space. If you look around the world, there aren't that many democratic 
legal spaces constructed. And uh, the next question, um, a real challenge in the future that I did not manage to uh, address today because we really need to finish, is the following. And it is the question is formulated in my mind uh, brilliantly by another uh, uh, writer, Jaap Hoeksma, and he asks the question as follows. Can the European Union function as a democracy without forming a state? Are we, you, will you be able to conceive a democratic unity in diversity? That is the question you have to answer. And with that question, I thank you for your attention. <laughs> questions? Yes, questions. Please use the microphone because we have a live stream. Uh, hello, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I would like to ask uh, what about the modern challenges of European court and uh, for instance uh, how do you evaluate the situation then some member states are challenging the supremacy of European Union court and European law such as Poland and Hungary cases. Thank you. Uh, well I will probably uh, you know not not evaluate evaluate that is that is truly for the for the politicians to evaluate uh, in such broad terms. But uh, as I emphasized in my, uh, in my lecture, uh, for the new type of integration, given that the question still will need to be answered, my final question, um, the primacy of the European Union law uh, is the alpha and omega. You can't, you, know, you can't live without it. And I believe I transmitted also to you that it is all about uh, you know, interpretation of Article 4 as far as the Court of Justice is concerned uh, in such, as, such cases as, for example, Tari Tariko II and Silevich now. And to me, uh, these cases show, these two cases really show that as far as Court of Justice is concerned, you know, there is uh, a, a legal thinking and a methodology to have uh, a very fine interpretation of unity in diversity. Primacy is unity and diversity is, you know, the course of, of national identities. And Court of Justice can sort of uh, evidently deal with that. Um, the rest of your question is, is really a, a matter of political process, uh, I would say, with uh, uh, the Court of Justice ensuring independence and impartiality of the tribunals. Now, the, the reason in uh, uh, many by now judgments uh, which have come from the Polish courts, uh, which have come from uh, Romanian courts, from Malta, on independence uh, uh, and impartiality of uh, the judiciary. You know, this is wh where, this is probably my real answer to your question. Um, the, the, the message is the following. According to Article 267, the responsibility for common European legal space is shared. It is the national courts and European courts. Because national courts are the first ones to apply EU law. We only interpret, for example. We, don't, we do not apply. It's the national courts. So by definition, European Union happens here, now, in Riga, in Ventspils, in, in Rezek, you know, in Gdańsk. That's where European Union law happens, not Luxembourg is just an assistance, I should say. So it is for this reason you need to have in Europe independent impartial tribunals. Imagine if your EU law is applied in a country or, or city X by the court, which is not independent and impartial. The way we have defined it, imagine what will happen to EU law. That is the matter. Yeah. And so that's why that's the uh, the that's what the Court of Justice is saying, and that is its response. Uh, yes, thank you. We get all the way back to Montesquieu and separation of power. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's a division of power. <laughs> that's why it's so important. <laughs> yeah. 
And we can only uh, make sure all the, of the European judiciary that we are, you know, stay together, independent and impartial. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very, very much for your lecture. It was uh, really fascinating. And actually, I, use, I want to use this opportunity to ask you maybe a bit more personal uh, statement. You mentioned here that you've been the <coughs> in, the, in the Latvian Constitutional Court, and then you moved to the European Court of Justice. Uh, so the, my question is, did your perspective change? It means when you change the place from national court to the, to the European Court. Mm -hmm. And if so, did they change in the perception of the, of the law, function of law, and uh, sources of the legitimacy of law, something like this? Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, my uh, understanding of united in diversity has not changed. Uh, I am learning. I am very grateful for the opportunity uh, now from within the Court of Justice um, to learn. I, I have uh, had this privilege in my life to learn from within, probably like very few do uh, in Europe, to learn from within the Strasbourg Court, the Constitutional Court and the Court of Justice. So I uh, am learning a lot of nitty gritty things, <laughs> a lot of technical things. But when it comes to the vision of how uh, a European judiciary should work together. Uh, that has not changed from irrespective of, of where I am. <laughs> so, yeah. I have a question. Um, in the first half of your lecture, you mentioned. Um, in the first half of your lecture, you mentioned the Kosovo and the Bosnia Herzegovina internationalization aspect where you said that the courts were internationalized because the constitutional courts were internationalized because judges were selected by the international European judges court, yeah. international mm -hmm, judges mm -hmm. why isn't that happening across member states in order to promote let's say european value synergy mm -hmm. um yeah it uh, there has been this idea uh you know um, because the, uh, the, the need for, um, for streamlining kind of ways of synergies is, is kind of obvious now in Europe, you know. And of course, what we should realize, that's why I'm addressing the future of Europe, that, um, I mean, we today probably cannot conceive of it. It will be for them to, to, to have these new ideas and, uh, and to have these new mechanisms. But there has been one idea in making, and it is, I think, Professor Weiler's idea where Professor Weiler says on Article 4 again, this one, uh, because the question here always is, now who has the last say? That's how the question has been for, uh, formed. Now, to be honest with you, I'm trying to get away. I'm trying to offer something in our legal thinking in Europe that gets away from this question of final, of final word. It is, it is not helpful. Uh, I don't think we will ever agree on that. You know, and so it is. So my discourse is, is on this, and, and a little bit going back to your uh, question. Now, Professor Weiler has gone, uh, uh, I think, uh, further, and is suggesting a mixed chamber, a mixed chamber on Article Four matters. For example, like you know, uh, uh, Tsilevich case could have been then decided by a, a mixed chamber you know, uh, a judge of a Latvian constitutional court and court of justice. So that is uh, what, what you are asking, you know, uh, Valid. Now, um, that, yeah, uh, but that this uh, idea is being debated. There are pluses uh, and minuses to it, but p who knows, maybe that is the future, you know. So um, one, one idea as to, I, Personally, uh, yeah, uh, I haven't maybe sufficiently reflected on this idea, but so far uh, what I have been working, and, and uh, I'm working evidently on this, uh, this topic, I still believe that through interpretation, 
staying within the competences of each uh, judiciary through interpretation we can still achieve the necessary uh, synergies and, and differentiations where necessary. I, I, I believe so, but maybe, but I'm always considered to be uh, an, an not only an optimist, but also somewhere <laughs> an, a utopian <laughs> representative of a utopian legal school. <laughs> I believe in good in people, that's why. <laughs> Um, thank you, Inata, for your lecture. I have a question. I'd like to go back to the opinion 213, where the court says that placing an e EU's accession to the ECHR would take away, in a sense, its autonomy because it would place it in a group of states, other 46 now, um, parties to the ECHR, and, that w and, and the EU is not a state. Well, that was, in the end, that wasn't really the argument. Uh, the argument was more about how to preserve the competences, specific competences of the European Union. No, no, um, it, it will be anyhow an accession uh, you know, of the Union uh, to uh, the uh, Convention, uh, that is fine, but it is about um, a, a more clear uh, and more acceptable to the uh, Court of Justice, I must say, a, you know, shared competence idea between the Court of Human Rights and the Court of Justice. That, that is really... Yeah, that, that's and my the question. And exactly. protection of level of human rights. Yeah, yeah exactly. My question is there, um, so on the one hand, it's a necessary move, it's a quite a symbolic move if the EU accedes to the ECHR, but on the other hand, to me, it does sound still as a valid argument that it does take away a portion of autonomy of perhaps maybe not the autonomy, but it does place the EU on a somewhat different setting. So how, how do you balance it? Because you, you've mentioned it already, but maybe you could elaborate how do we balance this necessity to exceed on the one hand, which maybe for someone else is arguable, but still, on, on the other hand, this fact that the EU would be then subject mm. to external control by, by the ECHR. Mm. Yeah, as I said, I don't have a problem with being controlled. <laughs> now, uh, that, that is, I'm, I'm away from that uh, type of thinking already. Uh, I'm really, we, we should shift the paradigms. We should not think in terms of control from, from one or another. We should think about uh, synergies and contributions to one another. It is a question of paradigms. But um, I'll give you uh, an answer from a practical point of view, because what I see uh, in my sort of daily work is, and I saw that, you know, I see it in all three courts. It is uh, the risk, a real risk, now when we uh, adjudicate a case which involves right to privacy, for example, and data protection, or which involves, you know, f uh, fair trial rights. And is if for some reason uh, we as a court of justice would look at the EU regulation or a directive or a framework decision in a certain way, and then the European Court of Human Rights or national constitutional courts have said, no, 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 on fair trial, this is the approach, okay? In reality, and we do have areas, uh, maybe St. Eden was one area, but that's not the only one. And recently in uh, B Post and North Zucker cases, the Court of Justice harmonized and the European Court of Human Rights harmonized its approach and the Court of Justice harmonized its approach. And we're trying to meet each other, although we are parallelly standing systems. It has taken years, it has taken years to harmonize it, but who suffers? That's a citizen. That's companies and citizens. And and in terms of, you know, you can't, you do not build law to uh, uh, have impediment to economic development and to the protection of individual rights. You d law has a different purpose. The purpose of law is to assist, you know, clear actions, economic or, or legal, you name it. That's the purpose of the law. Now, if in Europe, because of all of the history and how busy our house is with different systems and different courts, the law actually uh, is, a, is, is a barrier, then something is not right. And it is for this reason that it is imperative to bridge uh, these two, say, uh, two systems to really make sure that both courts know then 
you know, how do they apply each other's laws, you know, or, or how do they look at the judgments of each other? Because, uh, as I said, we have a number of areas of law where uh, the approaches have been different. Probably both legitimate, because in law, of course, you can have, you know, at least two different <laughs> legitimate choices. But uh, that, in the end of the day, you know, if a company in Germany has one understanding and it follows, for example, EU law, and then uh, a company uh, somewhere else, or, or, or in terms of uh, money laundering, for example, uh, applies another, that is legal uncertainty and, and that we really should avoid. Uh, so I believe that uh, we are all uh, creative enough to, uh, if the work pursues on uh, accession, uh, to find a way that indeed does not jeopardize, as you rightly said, uh, a very special character of the European Union. And, and it, is, uh, it is an achievement. Uh, it is an achievement um, and something new we are constructing you know, together. It's absolutely fascinating. And, and now I can tell you in the Court of Justice what I find as a, a very fascinating moment in history is uh, uh, the, the consolidation of constitutional EU law as a constitutional legal order. And uh, you know, having this privilege to, l to participate in that process from within to live through it um, I must say, I'm very humbled by, by, by that, but it's totally fascinating. Okay. Mm. Yeah. All right, so uh, if there are no more questions, uh, I hope, uh, um, you know, you um, got the feel for it, so to say and uh, that it will be helpful also to your, uh, in your next classes and uh, some of you may consider then continu continuing in a master program at the RGSL. It's uh, difficult, it's a lot of studying, <laughs> but it is uh, indeed world opening, I should say. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, thank you my master students uh, anywhere. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your attention and good luck with your studies. Mm? Thank you.